from Utrecht University and the title is Yankee Identities for Non-Geometric Fluxes from Palatini, Lovelock, Tartan Gravity. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank the uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, this talk is based on a paper which uh, was written in collaboration with Ralph Blumenhagen, Andreas Seeser and Felix Rennecke. Um, Ralph is also here, already gave a talk, and Andreas will give a talk on Thursday, I think. Um, this paper uh, fits kind of in this uh, whole discussion about non-geometric fluxes and non-commutativity and uh, non-associativity. And um, closely related work to, to the paper uh, I'm going to talk about appeared, uh, for instance, here, and there are some, some further papers. And we already heard uh, some talks about this by Ralph and uh, Dieter and David and uh, Peter um, just, uh, just recently. All right, so the main question, um, well, le let, me, let me first uh, review roughly the setting. <coughs> So what we heard already yesterday is that um, non-commutativity and non-associativity uh, non for the closed string can be characterized, for instance, by uh, these expressions where uh, the commutator of two closed string coordinates is giving uh, in terms of the Q-flux and um, the, um, say the, the cyclic double commutator of three closed string coordinates uh, can be expressed in terms of the R-flux. And um, this has been uh, investigated in a series of papers uh, which appeared uh, during the last two years. Now, these non-geometric fluxes Q and R, which are appearing here, um, we've already seen this picture, can be um, uh, obtained, for instance, by applying T-duality transformations. So for instance, if we start with a usual H-flux, which gives us a, a normal flux background on, on, on a flat torus, for instance, and if we apply one T-duality transformations, we arrive at something which one might call um, geometric flux, and the resulting space is something which people call a twisted torus. Now, uh, as we heard already yesterday, we can apply a further T-duality transformation to uh, arrive at something uh, called Q-flux, and the resulting space is called a T-fold, where not only different morphisms are needed to glue, uh, glue together patches, but also T-duality transformations. And then it has been argued that one can apply even a, a further t duality transformation to arrive at an R flux, and these spaces are uh, not even locally geometric anymore. Anyway, so this is uh, roughly the setting, and it is clear that uh, in order to understand non commutativity and non associativity, uh, we need a, a better, um, we might need a better understanding of these fluxes Q and R. And that uh, is the purpose of uh, this talk, or that was the purpose of this paper. Now, trying to find a better understanding of fluxes in gravity theories or in string theory, uh, many people have, uh, have done that, and this is all collected in these dot dot dots. <laughs> um, one, Can sorry. I just make a slight complaint? You've mentioned generalized geometry and double field theory, and you've not mentioned Hull and Zweibach, any other papers by anyone else. I mean, you know, these got, there's a whole group in Korea that have done double geometry. And oh, you, 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 mean, you, mean, you mean this? And there's, there's basically huge numbers of people, and you've not mentioned anyone other than your group. I mean, that's just a bit much. And sorry, you, you, you mean uh, this complaint yeah. here? This one. I, I'm sorry. I, and well, all the ones before as well. Uh, I mean, you know, ge double geometry's got a long history, and there's been a whole you, bunch you of mean people. Here, and then all of those, not a single mention of Hull and Zweibach, the whole group of Korea. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't want to uh, uh, neglect anyone. I just wanted to say that uh, work which uh, is closely related recently... Uh, closely related work appeared by... I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to uh, forget anyone. I'm sorry it's about that. It's just, you know, there's, there's groups of people who just don't happen to be here. Like, there's a group at Imperial. There's, a group, there's all sorts of people involved, right? I mean, come on. Never mind, get on. I'm sorry about that, I wanted to point out uh, a slightly different aspect of this work. And, uh, what I want, was about to say is that there's a lot of work done, which I didn't cite here. What I wanted to cite <laughs> is uh, a paper uh, a work which we heard just uh, an hour ago, uh, which I wanted to point out here. And what I want to talk about is uh, an even uh, a different um, uh, approach to understand fluxes and gravity theories. Um, based on the Palatino formalism. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so 
The Palatini formalism is, uh, uh, is the approach where you treat uh, the metric and the connection as an independent field. And um, so you would, for instance, write down uh, such an action where you indeed treat um, this metric and the connection as an independent field. If you um, look at the field equations for the connection and you solve, um, solve for these field equations, you find that uh, the connection, that the metric should be, um, um, or that the connection should be uh, metric compatible and that the torsion should be zero. So that means, uh, starting from this action, you, um, you find the levi chivita connection. And if you um, uh, before, uh, look at the field equations for the metric, you find Einstein's equation. Now, this is, uh, this is all well known. And what we now did was we wanted to incorporate fluxes into this framework. So what we did is we uh, modified um, the Riemann or the, uh, the Ricci tensor uh, in this way. So we introduced uh, another field, uh, a three-form field, eta, and um, uh, modified our uh, expression in this way. And here t is the torsion tensor. And if you then go through uh, this analysis, you see that uh, now the metric still has to be compatible, uh, the connection still has to be metric compatible, but it can have torsion, and this is what we wanted to achieve. And uh, the field equations for, um, uh, for the metric uh, are modified into this way. Now, if you then integrate out the connection and uh, just take uh, this torsion tensor, take, take this solution, plug it in here, what you find is that your action looks like um, the normal um, uh, Riemann tensor uh, with the levi civita connections, and there's a term uh, uh, looking like this. Now, to make a connection to string theory, um, it is uh, if you want to make a connection to string theory or the string action, the NS and S sector for constant dilaton, it's uh, done by basically uh, identifying this eta with the H flux. And if you set this constant c, c squared to 1 over 12, you indeed find uh, the string action of constant dilaton. And this is uh, long been known. So basically what you can achieve, at least at linear order in the curvature, is that you can identify the H flux uh, with the torsion. However, it has been shown that um, at higher orders uh, in the curvature tensor, for instance, in second order, uh, it has been shown that the H flux cannot be interpreted as torsion. And our main question at a technical level was to try to um, see whether, whether we nevertheless can find some interpretation uh, via the Palatini approach. And that's what I want to talk about. All right, so in order to, to look at higher order uh, gravity actions, we considered the, um, the Lovelock action, which is uh, shown to be consistent with the Palatini approach. Uh, it's given by this expression, where this is the determinant, and this is the uh, usual Riemann uh, tensor. And if you go um, through that, you can show that for k equals 1, you indeed find the einstein palatini action. For k equals 2, the gauss bonnet palatini action, and so on. And then, similar as we did before, to incorporate the fluxes, uh, we changed our Riemann tensor uh, in this way, which is very analogously of what we did before. Now, um, if you now go through the analysis at second order, well, first of all, the action at second order looks like this. Um, the what we do is we, uh, um, we, vary, we compute the field equations for the connection. We uh, see in order to solve that equation, we need to use this, uh, uh, the first order solution, which we found earlier. And in order to find uh, a proper solution, we also have to uh, impose these restrictions on these fluxes. So uh, the upshot is that uh, if you do the second order analysis, we find some uh, constraints uh, on, these, uh, on these fluxes eta. <coughs> now, then we looked again, can we, can we make that uh, compatible with string theory? Uh, but the answer is no, unfortunately. So in particular, even if you look at the lovelock palatini action in second order with h focus torsion, that's not compatible with uh, the string theory uh, uh, action at second order in R. However, just as a side remark, then um, if we modify our lovelock action this way, where we include these terms, then it can actually be made compatible. But it's just as a side remark. Since I'm uh, running a bit late, um, let me just mention that at third under the curvature, um, the action looks like this, uh, quite horrible. <coughs> and then you compute again the um, equations of motion for the connection, <coughs> and you try to solve that and show that uh, um, this, equa this equation is satisfied. And you can do that by using, again, the first of the solution. 
And actually, from the constraints on the fluxes I showed earlier, you find um, relation of this form, which you have actually have to employ. And uh, that's a quite, quite involved computation. Let me just mention that you can do that. Uh, we contracted this to be true for all orders. <coughs> but in order to, um, to go on, let me now have a look at um <coughs> these constraints <coughs> in a bit more detail. So <coughs> um, the constraints I mentioned um, are these here. And sorry about that. <coughs> and these constraints are a bit stronger than uh, the constraints for the H, uh, H flux we, we know. Sorry about that. Do we have some? No. <coughs> no, well, it's fine. <laughs> Just getting rid of it. Thanks. <coughs> so what I, I should have done that before. Now, um, <coughs> okay. What I wanted to say is that the constraints we found, uh, these here, are stronger than the uh, constraints you find from the usual Bianchi identities for the H flux. <coughs> However, if you look at these constraints in particular, you can see that uh, you can relate them uh, to <coughs> Bianca entities for non-geometric fluxes, uh, which were given, uh, for instance, in these papers here. And furthermore, um, these constraints here actually precisely appeared uh, uh, for certain solution for exact uh, string theory backgrounds, uh, for instance, for Vissarino mitten models. So <coughs> basically, our analysis where we wanted to, oh, let me go to the summary slide. <coughs> So our goal was to understand uh, <coughs> fluxes better in string theory. And what we knew is that a linear order in R, the H flux can indeed be interpreted as torsion, but uh, at higher order, this fails. And we wanted to um, understand that with the Palatini formalism, <coughs> where we indeed managed to uh, uh, identify the flux as torsion dynamically. But again, at second, second order, this uh, interpretation again fails for the string theory action. However, we um, saw that for this Palatini formalism to make sense, we <coughs> have to have new constraints on these fluxes, which can be interpreted as Bianchi entities. <coughs> and this kind of got us onto the track for the um, next papers where we actually studied Bianchi entities um, for these non-geometric fluxes in more detail. And Rolf <coughs> already talked about this, and um, Andreas uh, will talk about this in more detail. Uh, sorry for my voice, but, and uh, thanks. <coughs> <coughs> Some more questions or complaints? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Eric again.